Welcome back to Do No Harm, where we fight for patients and against identity politics in healthcare. Podcast hosts Benita Cotton Orr and Dr. Stanley Goldfarb will highlight the medical industry's most pressing issues and dangerous trends, and discuss how we can achieve a better healthcare system for all. Stan, we've been talking um, a lot about the research over the past um, a few episodes. So we know that the reach researchers are out there, you know, focusing on bias, alleged bias, on racism and all this woke ideology. Um, what responsibility do medical journals themselves have when they start publishing these because, you know, a lot of them are re respected, right? I mean, um, you don't expect to have um, bad research from respected journals. What's happening there? Would you, would you care to talk a little about that? Yes, I mean, this is a very a timely point because Nature, uh, which is probably the most prestigious scientific journal, just published a, uh, a set of rules about the fact that they were going to uh, censor research that they felt somehow demeaned certain groups or certain individuals um, and promoted some sort of stereotypes that they felt were wrong or unfair or demeaning. I mean, they kept using this word demeaning uh, to individuals or to, or to certain groups, suggested that we're going to have censorship of issues. So for example, if one identified the possibility that certain, you know, behaviors on the part of uh, a group of individuals living in a certain area, if they happen to be black, they happen to be Hispanic, they happen to be white, whatever they are, that this would be something that would be censored by, by nature and not be published in, in their journals and would be, that kind of research would be excluded from publication. So that was sort of the first time that there was really an overt censorship issue. Many journals have said they're going to publish articles that um, they focus on the, the race, the ethnicity of the individuals who are publishing their articles or reviewing the articles. Um, and again, this represented this intrusion of these racial issues into science that is supposed to be <laughs> as objective as possible. It's supposed, to, it's supposed to seek the truth. And truth is hard to seek and it's hard to find. Mm -hmm. But the effort is, again, based on you know several hundred years after the Enlightenment, that if we, uh, if we approach problems of, of uh, health or other scientific issues in the most objective uh, methods possible, we will come closer to seeking the truth. I mean, they threw Galileo in jail because he uh, proposed um, an approach that went against the theology of the times. And this really smacks of the same sort of thinking that science has to serve certain um, outcomes that are uh, prejudged. And if, they don't, if it doesn't, then it needs to be rejected. And this is really terrible. I gave an example in an earlier podcast about the fact that a journal decided that the word refused was a, a prejudicial word, which was an absurdity when it was in the medical record. It represented a, you know, a fact that occurred. A patient refused treatment. A patient refused laboratory tests. A patient refused recommendations. It needs to be documented that way. And that's the sort of article that will not be published in the future because it suggested that, you know, or at least it will be written in a way that would suggest that the, the, the patient's refusal in that case represented bias on the part of the physician mm -hmm. and did not represent uh, a, a behavioral problem on the part of the patient about uh, being accept accepting of their rec medical recommendations. So where is, the, where is this coming from? Who are the worst offenders? Well, again, you know, medical journals are, are run by, by medical academicians for the most part. The way you become an editor of a journal is to have a, a, an exemplary research career yourself, and then you become the editor of the journal. These editorships come up, they're, they're highly remunerated, and they, are, um, and they are highly sought after because they're very prestigious. So the individuals that run these journals are 
academicians, and the academicians are coming from these woke institutions that now have committed themselves to you know these woke sort of pursuits, and they're quite willing to un to corrupt the the scientific method and the scientific process in the name of equity, in the name of not having uh, any sense that there's a worse outcome because of any activities on the part of uh, a community or, uh, or, or any kinds of behavioral issues that might contribute. Again, I've mentioned in an earlier podcast that I think that one of the biggest reasons for poor health outcomes represents um, patients seeking health care late in the course of their illness. Now, you can decide that, that there are social issues that under, underlie this kind of behavior and that it's no fault of the patient. But nonetheless, one has to identify the reality that if the problem in outcome is because of seeking healthcare later in the course of illness, the way to correct that is to get treatment earlier in the course of illness. Anything else will be useless. And changing the behavior of the physician will not change things. Changing the patient's ability to get healthcare might change things, but not changing the physician's view of, how, of that patient will change things. So um, here's my little unscientific poll um, of you, poll of one. You, We talked in earlier episodes about your book, Take Two Aspirin and Call Me By My Pronouns. Has your book ever come up in any of the medical journals that um, are, are looking at um, but this kind of research, has anybody referred to your book? Has anybody reviewed your book in any of these journals? No, my book has been reviewed a few times, um, mostly by, uh, by journalists. Um, and uh, it's been, I, I'm happy to say it's favorably reviewed. I think no one's been willing to take the effort to review it who was going to trash it. But, but <laughs> in, that, in the medical um, journals too? But not, not in, in medical journals. I have been a, attacked in the New England Journal quite in an in interesting way. And I wrote about that in my book. They attacked me for my original op-ed back in 2019, in September 2019, in the Wall Street Journal. The group that attacked me, it was quite an interesting um, attack that was made. It was by Paul Farmer, who was a very famous physician in his group. He was a, uh, and he unfortunately passed away recently uh, in a very untimely fashion. Um, but but he's been very active in uh, in the Caribbean, uh, particularly in Haiti, establishing sort of medical missionaries. And he's been a very important force in this idea that social medicine is, really needs to be the way medicine is practiced. Um, and it, it certainly may be quite true in, in underdeveloped countries, for example, like Haiti. Uh, but his group attacked me for what I wrote because they felt that not understanding social problems prevented a physician from treating patients adequately. They gave examples that were, I thought, sort of absurd and, and really missed the point. One example they gave of why um, this is crucial is to talk about a, a, some individual who was a transgender woman who um, came into um, uh, the, um, I guess a transgender man, I have to get the terminology proper, but came into the emergency room complaining of abdominal pain and they missed the fact that the patient was pregnant. And it really was uh, biologically a woman who was pregnant and yet had all of the physical characteristics of a man uh, in terms of clothing and, and name and, uh, and facial hair, et cetera, because of having undergone uh, a gender transition. Um, and they pointed out that you needed to understand gender transitions in order to care for the patient. Well, my point was you needed to examine the patient. You needed to do a complete physical examination when a patient comes in with abdominal pain, including examination of the genitalia and an internal examination if it's a woman who has abdominal pain to understand the, the basis of that pain. And I pointed out that, you know, this was a, a knowing all the social issues about transgender health was not going to save that patient. What re was required mm -hmm. was a good physical examination. They gave me another example of a, a physician that was uh, in working in rural Mexico and had children that were uh, showing up with signs of severe malnutrition. It turns out the family just didn't have enough food. And they said the solution was to train the family in farming methods, which the, the physician tried to do, but was unsuccessful because the physician 
was in this not world, a farmer. Was not a farmer and didn't <laughs> understand what was required. And so that they really didn't solve the nutrition problem at all. And, and so I thought that their examples actually proved my point. Uh, but they they felt that because uh, nutrition was such a, a key factor and because the, the gender uh, issues of that patient were such a key factor, you needed to understand these social issues in order to treat the patient. When in fact, reality will, would tell anyone that, that that's just not the case. Those are important issues, but they're not issues for the physician. They're issues for a Peace, Peace Corps worker. They're issues for a, a, a psychiatrist, perhaps, the transgender issues, but they're mm -hmm. not in, the, the issues of, of understanding the basis for transgender uh, activity is not the, the province of a physician who's treating a patient with abdominal pain. Their problem is to make sure they understand you know, what the etiology of the pain is and, and to treat it properly. All right. Well, thank you.